Hi, welcome to Third Space Live. I'm Jody Peel, and this is a show that offers conversation stories and ideas around building mental wellness. Today, I'm going to be joined by Melissa and Dallas, but before I introduce them, I'll remind you that you can learn everything about Third Space charity on our website at thirdspacecanada.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram and watch previous shows on YouTube. So today we're going to be speaking about self-identity and youth culture. Joining us is going to be guest host Dallas Stober. Uh, and before I introduce her, I'm going to introduce you to Melissa Appleton. She's been on our show before. She's part of the Third Space team. She's also a chaplain and she's a mom. And her and I are both wearing our mom hats today, um, talking to uh, guest host Dallas. So Dallas is uh, entering her fourth year of psychology studies at Trinity Western University. And I'm going to hand the floor over to her now, and she's going to be hosting the show. So thanks for joining us, Dallas. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, yeah, so this Zoom call meeting is just to kind of have like a casual conversation um, regarding young adults in today's society and culture. Um, and I wanted to start off by describing one of the most prominent cultural shifts, and it's this idea from uh, Warren Sussman, who is a historian who invested his, his time in unpacking cultural history and pop culture. Um, and he had this theory that there's been a shift from what he calls like a culture of character um, to a culture of personality. Um, and basically what he observed was uh, culture becoming more focused on being well received and admired and rather than emphasizing good morals and qualities. Um, and so this, this kind of shift that we're gonna be talking about first is um, kind of how we desire to be disciplined and serious and honorable, um, shifting more towards focusing on how others perceive us and kind of becoming this performing self, if you will. Um, and I'm kind of just wondering, I lost my notes here, if uh, you guys could, oh, it's gone, speak on what you think um, has, I guess, contributed to this cultural shift and also your own experience in, in the shift. <laughs> in our prep for the show a moment ago, yeah, you had some good points. Why don't you kick that off? Yeah. Um, well, there certainly has been a big shift, and I feel like we've been primed for this kind of shift for a long period of time. And the biggest one, like the biggest movement that I kind of felt happen was this kind of outsourcing from the family home uh, into, uh, outsourcing from the family home and from community engagement into the idea of an individual making their own way and becoming successful and known for something. So that would have started in the 60s, it hit, it hit a pinnacle in the 80s, maybe. Yeah. And now it's shifting through technology into something else. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Okay. And I, yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Jody. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in my, in my own experience and kind of this um, idea that I've been really marinating on for a while has just been the influence of um, the internet and social media and I know you guys had a bit of that growing up in, in TV and movie and, and that sort of media format and now switching to kind of this more I guess individualistic culture of social media and presenting yourself and seeing how well received you are by um, others. Um, yeah we didn't have a platform Everybody now with technology not only has a platform dedicated or multiple platforms or channels dedicated to themselves and um, sharing content and images and ideas all about them and how it, it's all about reflecting on who they are, creating identity around that. Like you, you'd suggested you know, a, a curated image of themselves. Mm -hmm. We never had that. And um, I can't imagine what it's like, so I want every, I want to make sure that everybody understands that I'm not, I don't understand what it's like. So all I can do is offer the perspective of, of a 50 year old woman and mother of, of teens. Um, we did have influences, but we didn't have such individualized influences. And we also didn't have those influences with us all the time. We didn't carry it around in our back pocket or have it in front of our face all day, every day. 
Mm-hmm. So to me, that's uh, something I can't relate to, but I can imagine that that's really hard to live with and really hard to ignore. And it would be really hard to navigate that. It yeah. is. Yeah. I, I think I'm on a little bit of a, of a soul searching journey, kind of trying to figure out like, growing up with social media and the internet and having access to all things all the time and then entering an era now where you have all these um, influencers and celebrities are kind of in your backyard or in your pocket, I guess, rather than like out there on MTV watching and um, how it influences my own personal life and the pressure of, what did I say before? Like, uh, building up this currency that you kind of trade off with other people and um, it gives you value. And I think um, what Warren Sussman was trying to get at was um, building and curating your own personality for others to see rather than finding your own value in it and being satisfied with kind of like what you guys talked about before having your couple friends know you and that's good enough. And now it's like, no, we can like blast our whole lives on the internet and have it be terribly received or really well received. And then we get value based off of that. And I think that's a big part of my own personal life right now. And I know like um, volunteering with younger, with the younger generation, I mean, I guess we're all part of the same generation, but they're younger than me and they're growing up even more so immersed in that. Um, Yeah. Like, what would it be like for you, Dallas, if you stepped off of um, social media and just ended developing a personality or um, an image on social media? If you just decided, I'm going to experiment in real time, real person, real body with becoming somebody and it had nothing to do with technology what like paint a picture of what would that be like for you i've thought about this quite a bit but i like would be lying if i said that the idea of completely removing myself and i've i've chatted with my friends about this too and they kind of say the same thing like this idea of removing yourself completely from online it's kind of like well like what do you what do you have left because we put so much time and energy into placing value in how you look online or what you do online or how much you watch or listen to or whatever it is and um i think it like some of my best moments have been like when i have taken breaks from social media and i and i'm not here to say like i'm defined by what my instagram is or what it is but it's definitely like a huge part of growing up, I think, in today's in today's day. And it's shaped me a lot in the sense of like how you interact. Like all of a sudden dating's online now too. Like especially in quarantine, which is a little bit of a segue, but like this whole concept of finding people online and selling yourself online rather than showing up on a blind date or to dinner and presenting yourself that way it's like you're writing down all of your best attributes and you're forgetting all the negativity it's really like I think the reason why people love online and social media so much is that it is just the highlight reel of everyone's life and there's nothing bad and it's just great all the time and you see pretty people all the time and I I think I kind of lost my original point but (laughs) of online dating was perfect yeah because let's use that example of you're you're curating an image of yourself that's based on the best of everything mm-hmm. the gig up when you actually meet the person and you have to actually try to have a relationship with someone because that's not the reality you're not perfect all the time you don't look like you do and you're chosen selfie all the time you yeah. certainly your life isn't all roses all the time so mm-hmm. how do you make sense of that that they that if you you base uh so much value on the image, how does that translate to meaningful friendships and relationships? Yeah, I think that is a really great question. And in my own life, I try to be pretty transparent or pretty like, yeah, pretty transparent on social media and try to keep my image kind of relatively what I look like in real life. And like, that's not the case for a lot of people, which I think is part of the issue. All of these young kids looking up to influencers who are the best of the best and like 
cut down to just the greatest um, aspects, but yeah. Can you be seen? Like if you were not on social media platforms, would you be seen by your friends? Would you still be connected with your friends? Would people seek you out um, to connect with you in person? Or do you think that you would slowly kind of disappear out of the social scene? No, I, I like, because like I said before, like this has been a conversation I've kind of been juggling for a bit and I don't think it's worth putting your all into the internet if it doesn't translate to like real life. And like, I make a point of making sure that I have good friends and I'm surrounding myself by good people and I don't need the online aspect. I think what I'm more getting at is how big of a part it plays in just today's general culture and society. But I am realizing now as I'm speaking out loud, my experience is also quite different, I think, than what I was originally thinking about. That's a good thing. That means our conversation is meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I'm processing as where I'm like, okay, like how much a value do I place on this personally? I actually don't place that much value as much as I think I thought that I did. Um, is there a FOMO, is there a FOMO aspect to all of this? You're, you're terrified of missing out if you didn't participate because I love your question. Like, what if you just chose not to participate? If you just said, you know what? I remember some of the best times of my life is, is not the online stuff or it's when I'm not super engaged online and I'm going to try this experiment and I'm going to not engage for a month and see how that feels and see what my life looks like. What would be the downside or the risk of doing something like that? I think FOMO is definitely, oops, sorry, a great way to put it because I, I know a lot of people struggle with that. Um, I started probably a couple years ago realizing like when I go out or if I'm participating in an event, like I'll make a point to put my phone away and like actually be present and be focused on what's going on. The biggest practice I think that I've implied is like going to concerts and not taking videos of the whole thing so I can watch it later. Like I'm watching it in real time. <laughs> if, I, if I forget about it, okay, fine. But at least I know that I was present in that moment. And that's been really powerful for me personally. I know the pain. By the way, I'm I, in my family unit. I am the documenter and I'm also love taking pictures and I also have a really bad memory. So I take pictures as a way to try to capture my life. Mm -hmm. Losing it. So different motivations, but I understand how uncomfortable it is yeah. to not try to capture things all the time. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I also like that could be we could talk about this idea of like, we have accumulated so much stuff and all of these attributes and all of this online currency that we have a really hard time letting go of these things, of not documenting what's going on, of not taking a photo, of not having our phones with us, of not texting our friends in real time, hey, you won't believe what just happened. and we like are just constantly collecting all of this like stuff that's happening and it, it, I like it can be really overwhelming I think it's really overwhelming and I mean, this trend right of the social media detox yeah I don't know if you see it on your stream but I see it all the time mm -hmm. just wanted to let everybody know I'm taking a one month or a two month social media detox and just the the linguistics of that the the idea that it's called a detox would kind of say that this is toxic and not good for us and I actually need to take a break. And I guess my question could also be, why are we doing a detox and why do we return to the same behavior? If indeed we call it a detox. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know. <laughs> I can give you an example of something I've noticed as a mom that- Yeah, please. Yeah, so I have, two sons about to turn 19, I mean 18. Uh, again, they're males and not to be gender uh, ex exclusive, but, or say anything more than that, that, there seems to be a tendency that a lot of the male 
teens that I know aren't as engaged in their social media in the same way as some of the females I know. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's part of it. But when we go away every summer, we didn't this summer because of COVID, but we typically go away somewhere that doesn't even have electricity. So everybody's unplugged for about 10 days. And I noticed that this detox that's going on, it's not voluntary. <laughs> um, it's something I look forward to, but everybody's a little agitated and off for a few days while we adjust to not being connected all the time, including myself and my husband. It's not just the kids. Yeah. But then I noticed that about day three or four, everybody starts calming down and, and they're not jonesing for the technology all the time. They're not always trying to find their phone or it just feels different. And then I noticed that everybody starts talking and connecting mm -hmm. differently, uh, particularly the siblings to one another. Um, and it's a beautiful thing. And at the end of the holiday, I always ask, you know, how does this feel? What was your experience not being connected? And it's always positive, whether it's my husband telling me that or the kids telling me that. And yet we return. We return. Part yeah. of it, you have to return to some level, not the social media piece necessarily, but technology because of work or school life or whatever, but interesting. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, all three of my kids say, they have this longing of wishing that they lived in the time that I was raised so that they didn't have way to back go then? way back. Yeah. <laughs> 70s kid so mm -hmm. that they could live at a time where there wasn't this much technology and this much social media. They have that deep inner sense, like they know it's not good for them, that they're co-opted by the culture and they can't escape it. I feel that way too. I totally feel that way. Yeah. Like I, I let go of Facebook a year and a half ago mm -hmm. and in my preparing to do it, it was like, I, I mean. There's a morning. There, it was really scary. Yeah. It now seems kind of crazy, but it was really difficult to do. And then within like two, three weeks, I was totally fine, completely fine. Except that I couldn't erase it completely. There's this one button that says, you know, if you press this button to cancel it this intensely, it'll erase your entire history and you can never get it back. And I still haven't been able to press that button. So I've done that probably five times. And it still comes back? No, I just keep going back to it. So I was <laughs> off social media for quite some time. And then with this new position with Third Space, I felt because we serve students and everybody's online, I felt like I had to get, and then it sucks you in again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm still on Instagram. But like from the perspective of a mom, so I have two girls and a son. And um, not, none of them are really big on social media. Probably my youngest daughter would be the most. My oldest daughter, she has no interest. She's like opted out a long, long time ago. How old is Leela, your youngest? Leela's 13, India's almost, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Guys. Almost 18. This is public. No, um, she's almost 17. Yeah, almost 17. <laughs> they aren't big on social media. They don't have a profile that's intense. They don't have a brand that they're trying to build. Not big on followers. They pop in here and there. But we've had this dialogue in our house from the very beginning. And it kind of started with me qualifying by saying, I'm totally new at this too. I'm doing this right along beside you. I can feel how the addiction works in me. I know that this platform was designed by neuroscientists to hack my brain, to co-opt my life. And so and every that, time- And that's not being a uh, conspiracist. That's like, no, that's just fact. That's, that's science. fact, yeah. 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 Um, my husband and I have read books on it to make sure that we're educated on it. So sometimes if I'm on social media and I can feel my emotional quality changing, I'll publicly say in the room where my family is, gosh, I've been looking at this for 15 minutes. I'm starting to feel really lonely. And I feel kind of crappy. Like after looking at all these things, I feel like I'm kind of not doing enough with my life and not being enough. And I feel totally less than I got to put it away for a while. So I just self-identify all the time what I'm experiencing when I'm engaging in it. So now like my youngest daughter will actually say, God, I feel crappy. I'm going to put this away. Or she'll leave it and come into the kitchen and kind of do something feisty. And she'll say, oh gosh, this is because I was on uh, social media for a while. I can feel like this anger inside of me and uh, I'm going to go outside for a bit. So we've done this self-qualifying practice from the very beginning. It's crazy how much it can 
really intensify your emotions and even your own self image and how you view yourself. Cause I know like after, like I am trying to make a conscious effort to cut back on just like mindlessly scrolling on Instagram or whatever, because it doesn't make me feel good. It makes me feel worse about myself and my life and oh man, I should be doing this. I should be going buying in that. I should look like this or whatever it is. And it's just like this crazy inner turmoil that it creates. Yeah. Like, but I will constantly return, right? Because it's like instant gratification. And also like, it's just a distraction. And I think like another aspect of it is like uh, how it's been um, like shifting my attention span or just even like the attention span of us as a collective, um, always having something to do, whether you do it or not, you always, if you have your phone on you, you always have something to look at. You always have something to read. You always have something to distract you from what's going on. And I think that would be one of the, well, it is one of the beautiful aspects of Jody, like your detox and kind of, it could be part of the like readjustment to not having something to distract you all the time or even something to flick through or look at the time or whatever it is, I think that like when I have detox that's been the hardest part is just like I'm sitting here and what what am I doing now I can't like you know there's nothing to distract myself with and then being able to sit in the quiet yeah and yet there is like there's so much good content out there so much amazing content to read and to engage with that mm -hmm. has nothing to do with social media like the content is actually pretty empty I know that it's empty and yet I keep returning to it, Dallas. And I, mean, I have a history with addiction, recovery, and working in that sphere professionally. And I can tell you that Instagram is no different than the way that I consumed alcohol. Mm -hmm. There's no difference whatsoever. It's the same feeling. It's the same behavior pattern. It's the same emptiness. And, you know, if I at the end of my life, if I'm on my deathbed at 85 years of age and somebody reports back to me, Melissa, did you know that you spent 5.5 years scrolling through social media? Like the kind of grief, I mean, just thinking about that is so deeply sad. Mm -hmm. So deeply sad in the human connection time that I could have had or the time in nature that I could have spent, or the amount of really good information that I could have soaked my mind into to open my mind and to remove my biases so that I could engage more effectively in this world. Or the wisdom you could have developed, or the impact or contribution you could have made. The list goes on and on. Yeah, or like you said, tell us the boredom the boredom that I could have engaged in to free my mind. Yeah. That's, that's what I find interesting is my fear. Uh, watching, learning a little bit about it and then watching young people that are in my life is that it having that constant distraction adds to your anxiety, not just because of the reasons we've already discussed, but also because there's no space in their life and in their day to process and unpack and contemplate and absorb what's gone on in their day, whether it was something that was a win or felt good or something that was bad or a failure or something that, you know, an interaction with someone that didn't go great. And then you, 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 you know, back before social media all the time, you'd be sit, sitting there with those feelings and you'd have to process them. So it's like, wow, maybe then you, you end up realizing that hmm, maybe I could have done something different. Maybe next time I'll try something different. And that's how wisdom happens. And that's how you learn things. And that's how you develop as a person. And when you're constantly distracting yourself, I notice that that agitation is just always there waiting the second you stop because all these things are happening in your life. You're not processing them or unpacking them. And then, so when you get off your, your phone, this mountain of stuff is sitting there waiting for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Dallas. Yeah. Um, there's, I'm just like reeling. Sorry. But no, 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 it's okay. I, like I said earlier, like I'm processing as we're talking about and just like reflecting on my own experience. Um, 
yeah, there is no space to debrief with yourself or to go over things like everything is so quick, everything is so fast, you have to keep up. And if you don't want to deal with something, you can easily distract yourself. And also making choices is so much easier because it's so much faster. And um, yeah, I... <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you, does this state of affairs, does it concern you from your point of view? Are you concerned about this or not yeah. really? No, I am. And I think that's why I wanted to open up the conversation and just like talk about it because I don't like I think social media and our access to the internet and all of the repercussions that that brings and all of the decision making and the and the attention span and the and the quality of life just in its entirety is pretty detrimental, I think. And I see it in my own life and I have like made changes to try and like bring up I guess my quality of life aside from the internet and social media but then also like like I said like I volunteer with young teens and watching them try to navigate through that it just adds like as if life isn't hard enough let's add in this crazy tool that is going to make everything amplified and worse yeah and let our kids also be able to use it while they're in school oh yeah no and it's it's like kind of what we were talking about like um, before we started like figuring yourself out and figuring life out and trying to navigate it and then having it just it's just so much harder and cognitively it's hard to like I, what were you saying Jody self-actualize um, in terms of your yeah, your cognitive ability yeah, maybe but. I'll repeat that because we talked about that before the show but the I, I spoke to one of the counselors here at Third Space before in preparation for the show. And he wisely reminded me that the adolescent phase of your life is the right time to be exploring all those about who you are, what your values are, who you want to be, what kind of life you want to have, um, what you feel strongly about, what's important to you. So social media is cool that way. Is that, in a way that we never had in my generation is you've got access through technology and the internet to global information, uh, different types of lifestyles, different fashion, music, you name it. So, you know, in the eighties when I was a teen, um, yeah, I tried on a whole bunch of different things for size and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's really great because that's how you figure out who you are. The issue is, is if you get stuck there and you're always looking outside of yourself to seek validation or self-worth or your identity that you're constantly repeating or, or mirroring what you see out there that whoever this celebrity person or influencer is wearing a certain outfit or wearing their hair a certain way that you feel like you have to do that too and then you know you don't want to end up there because that's not self-actualization that's not figuring out once you know you move your way through the adolescent journey and you develop into hopefully a self-actualized adult that you're like you look inside then you know who you are and how you feel and what you want and what's important to you you're not looking outside anymore right that's what we had talked about yeah and the difference of like say maybe in our generation in that teenage or early 20s stage of being seen and the way that we did our hair, wore our clothes, or the kind of music that we listened to, was that we were trying to create an identity or to be seen in the presence of other people in real time. Right. And there's a physical resonance that happens between us. So yeah. like, you try, you wear a certain outfit, you do your hair a certain way, you go into a group of people, buy and you can kind of, of like yeah. buy a certain kind of drink, have a certain kind of night, and you have all that physical resonance happening between you and the people that you're with and it elicits a kind of feeling like do I like this am I comfortable with this how does this relate to other people does it bring me closer does it bring me further away it's true and you're um, seeing their reaction you're watching you're seeing, their reaction yeah. in real time yeah. you're like huh would I do this again would I do this differently oh, I liked it when this happened I didn't like it when this happened and you were only trying to uh interact or influence or um, impress your peer group. Yeah, the people you that you're to actually it, with. Yeah, not you the know? world 
or yeah or like there might be strangers there that you don't know who pick up on you and you would have a sense of like oh this feels kind of good or oh this doesn't feel good this this is not appropriate and and then when you fail it's failing in front of those small number of people yeah and, and not the whole world right and it's not recorded forever yeah or uh, it a little bit of time yeah. until the next big rumor comes on. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you think that like contributes to, I guess, this increase in young adult identity issues because, you know, on one hand you got you're seeing all of this and and you're not having time to, I guess, make mistakes and and try out different things because you already kind of have the bar up here. And if you can't reach that, like, I... I see where you're going with that. Yeah, do, you see what I, do you see where I'm going? Like, what do you, th yeah. What do you think about that? How do you think that is contributing to uh, young adult identity issues? Our topic, if you will. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm clear on, can you say that one more time? <clears throat> um, yeah, I think, Okay, so what you're saying is, like, when you guys were growing up, it was kind of trial and error, and with a small audience, mostly with your friends, like, the ability to um, try something and fail at it was not, like, the risk was not as great, I guess, as it would be today if you were to try something, post it on social media, have a negative response, and then, boom, everything kind of tanks. Um, and so... The negative response isn't even real. That's it's gonna, not real people. Yeah. It's almost yeah. worse with your peer group because they're actually people that matter that you have a relationship with. Why mm -hmm. would it matter if a bunch of thousand strangers who follow you don't approve? What does that say yeah. about you? And why is that important to you? And it's also perception. Like, here's the thing. When you're experimenting with your identity with people, um, responses are more real and intimate. But a lot of times with social media, we're conjuring ideas and concepts about how we've been perceived and it's not actually how we've been perceived at all. They're just thoughts and ideas and perceptions, but it's not real. Mm -hmm. It's not even real because we're not even really talking to the other person to find out how they feel, how they received us. We don't hear any vocal intonation. There's no energy emitted between people. And a lot of times we're eliciting ideas about how we're being perceived based on a number of likes and a few comments that have no vocal tone and so often get misconstrued. Fascinating, and you know it's true. You're getting likes, more or less likes. What does that even say? There's no <laughs> substance to that feedback. And yeah. you don't even know if those people are honest or not, Yeah. right? Right. Right. It's like, oh, I'm going to like this person because they liked me last week. Right. Right. It's not, it's kind of, it's not even a real atmosphere. It's not a real paradigm. It's not a meaningful measurement. There's nothing. What is it? Yeah. I mean, those, the likes and those hearts and things were constructed by neuroscientists to hit dopamine receptors in the brain. It's crack. <laughs> it, it is essentially. Yeah, it be, honestly, if we have to go through detoxes to get yeah. away, it's, 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 there's a total, there is a detox center in Seattle, I believe, for social media addiction. It's one of the first of its kind. That's wild. It's wild. It's super wild. And you know what amazes me, Dallas, is like, so all around the world right now, um, scientists are working very, very hard to find a vaccine or a protocol for COVID-19. How many, I don't know what the number is, but how many clinical trials and how many people it has to move through before it can actually be used on the public is astounding. Mm -hmm. And there will even be a large percentage of people who refuse to take that vaccination because of lack of trust. Mm -hmm. And here we have social media platforms that have been designed by neuroscientists to hit addiction centers in the brain. They have never been tested, and we willingly use these all over the world without any question at all. And get them and to our kids. And we give it to our kids, and it's totally changing the structure of our brain, and we're ignoring it. Yeah. I mean, I, I sound like a fundamentalist. Or we're not well. ignoring it. I think there's a lot of talk about being fearful about it. But no yeah. one has solutions. No. Like, because it's, 
it's like a drug. It's and, like an addiction. And I think it's important to, when we have, before you respond to that, is to be mindful of the distinction between technology and social media. Yes. Because, and between yeah. the types, this is, I, this is not my thought. This is stuff I've learned um, when seeking help to do parenting. Um, I was taught by someone else that social media and technology can be super great if they're used correctly. And social media, when it's a two-way street, like my, my boys tend to use it as a way to connect with their friends, not sit there and project an image of themselves online, but to actually chat live. Or, so I've been told that that's not a bad thing because it's actual connections, particularly with COVID. Yeah. You want to stay connected. But yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, that's different. And yeah. people don't use landline telephones as much anymore. Right. And it is kind of sweet to be able to take out your phone and actually hit the camera and be able to see somebody in chat. It's, kind of, it's yeah. pretty cool. So we're not talking about that so much. Yeah, not talking about that. Okay. I think like I'm talking about the Facebook, the Snapchat, um, and the Instagram, and the establishing of character, like you mentioned originally, mm -hmm. a character that is personality based, the building of a personality and a persona, as opposed to developing real time moral character in the family and in the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think we covered a lot. I do want to switch gears just a bit and talk about um, more of the mental health aspect um, and kind of how media romanticizes this idea about mental health and depression and suicide and how it affects, yeah. You. I'm going to challenge you on that. I don't know that, I don't know that the media romanticizes it. I think that we spoke about this again when we were preparing. What I've noticed through the work we do at Third Space with uh, young adults is that um, what we're noticing is that this generation has been brought up in a time where the mental health conversation, which 10, 20 years ago was the movement was to actually get people to start talking about their mental health because it was so taboo. So these, this generation has been brought up in an environment where a lot of people are talking about it, but unfortunately we failed to create literacy around what's mental illness, what's problematic and what is just an emotional feeling. So what you're seeing is a lot of young people will talk very openly uh, about, um, a negative emotion or mm -hmm. emotional state, but they jump from identifying the fact that they don't feel good inside and jump right to, oh, this must be mental illness. There's something wrong with me. This is a condition. I need to get help. I need to get medication. Or like you said, the romanticization, meaning um, getting attention maybe through that or getting sympathy through that. So yeah. let me just Go clarify when I say like the romanticization of, of mental health is like um, and like Netflix TV shows there was this one 13 reasons why and the whole show romanticized the suicide of this girl and how it affected um, all of these other people in her life and people were obsessed with it and but it was like I, I read the book and the book was good and then I watched a bit of the show and I was like this is just basically, you know, if you don't want to use romanticization, but like glorifying um, mental health because you get all this attention. And what did we, I think we talked about, like you said, you swapped out um, that word for drama and there's like a lot of drama around it. Um, yeah, so what I, that the drama point was that uh, we also know that adolescents, this part of people's development, young adults, um, drama is another thing they try out. Um, if you're seeking attention, you're trying to figure out who I am and get attention, uh, you create drama often to do that sometimes, uh, bad attention we call it sometimes, uh, and discussing your emotional state or suggesting that you're mentally ill is another way that some people might try to draw attention to themselves, um, rightly or wrongly. Everybody, every generation does it in different ways. This is just maybe something that's being used now because it's top of mind and the, the culture is different around that that topic yeah yeah I guess my question would be 
sometimes the only, it seems like the only way that we can talk about these things is to medicalize ourselves. I use the word medicalize as to also include mental health. But so if, if we don't fall into the category of a mental health issue, but we're having intense emotions, intense experiences, breakups, whatever. Which might be normal. Yeah, totally and normal. Not a but medical issue. <laughs> really intense. And think about the structure of our culture and our communities and how it's changed over 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't go to church as much. There aren't as many community gatherings. There aren't as many family dinners. Friends spend less time together in person and more time in virtual spaces. So it's like, where do people get to unleash this? So it would make sense to me that there would be some romanticizing over these things because I don't know what the containers are to hold these things anymore. Like they're not as strong as maybe they were 50 or 60 years ago. So, and people need to be seen. People need to be heard. Um, connection is like our biological imperative. And if people don't feel seen and don't feel connected, all kinds of interesting behaviors come out. And the biggest platform right now would be to do that through media. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, before we spoke, I talked about the Brené Brown movement. Which yes. is, I know, you know, people love her and she writes, I mean, she's a great researcher. She writes some great things, wonderful speaker, but like this vulnerability movement, I don't think what she's talking about is to get on social media and to write your most vulnerable life experience for the whole world to see. That's, mm -hmm. that is not like every three days, write a monologue on your biggest internal reflections and self-actualization. I think it means get together with some people and like be with them in and person be real and be real and maybe listen instead of speak. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. It kind of goes back to this idea of like wanting to be seen and heard. And I guess like utilizing mental health or being vulnerable, like you said, to project that out and to again, be seen and, and heard. And I agree with you. I don't think, like whenever I'm, you know, scrolling on Instagram and I see someone doing their little internal or I guess external monologue on how they're taking a break from social media and whatever happened in their life and how they were really struggling with it and now they're blasting it out there. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to know that. Like it almost, it, it sounds even more fake than I think their meaning. They, they, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. And maybe what Melissa is saying is that it's actually real. It's kind of a, comes from a place of desperation for connection that is hard to find these days. It's hard because those conversations and revelations and should be in safe, secure environments with trusted people, not to a bunch of strangers. But if your the way you live or your culture is such that you exist mostly online with a bunch of strangers. How do you make sense of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I also really want to qualify here that I don't think that this is just happening to your generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel it even in my own peer group that it seems like it's so much easier for my peer group to have a persona on Instagram and to talk about their lives but it's so hard to get someone on the phone, Dallas. I hate the phone. And it's so hard for people to get together. Like, I learn more about my friends through social media than I do in-person time. That's really... And it, I don't think it's just your generation. And I think that maybe there's some Latin development that didn't happen for us that is showing up in social media, even in the 40, the 50, and the 60-year-olds. We're, we're like right back in that teenage um, center landscape development I, stage. I have a different experience than you. Do you? Um, yeah, I ahead. definitely find out the real, I have the real authentic connection and that meaningful uh, getting to know my friends in real time, in private. Um, so that's, I'm not learning stuff so much through Facebook. Antidotal little bits and bobs of their life for sure, yeah. but not the deep stuff. Yeah. Um, but I do notice that even people my age are succumbing to the pressures of this um, social media identity. 
um, that we started this conversation with Dallas. Uh, and probably for the same reasons that it's addictive and hard not to participate in for your generation, there's people our age that are also succumbing to that. So yeah, it's not a judgy thing. Yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. I, yeah, and I don't wanna like say that I, like, I'm not meaning to say that I don't like when people get on social media and blast out their most vulnerable moments. I think one of the best things that has come out of the area, the era of social media is people are kind of deciding to push back and actually be honest and raw and real. And there, we didn't even really, we haven't talked about that aspect of, of I, social media, but there's this incredible like movement that is, hey, like we're being honest and we're going to be super raw and I'm going to show you a little bit of my life that isn't so manicured and pretty and beautiful and hey I'm actually struggling and I am dealing with this and that and I I love that aspect of social media and I do love when people utilize that. Um, There's a comedian who's our age uh, our generation called Celeste Barber and she's hilarious. I love her. So she's <laughs> an average uh, middle-aged woman who takes um, what would you say, um, image culture, uh, and she makes fun and mock her, mocks it by, uh, what is it, trying to, what's the word, not repeat it, but not emulate it, but she copies it, and it, it becomes funny and absurd because it so, goes so wrong <laughs> because she's not a six foot, you know, 100 pound, 20 year old model. It's and so it's great. so great. <laughs> and it's, it, it makes the point so beautifully. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I love social media. I have friends all over the world. Me too. And the, if I didn't have social media, if I wasn't on Instagram, I don't know if I'd be able to keep in touch with them and know parts of their life. So I really, really appreciate that I can make friendship in the world seem closer. Mm -hmm. um, and especially like, uh, my American friends and people in my spiritual practice community, I don't know when I'm going to be able to cross the border into the States again. And I love how I can get on Instagram and I can see somebody there and just hit the video button and actually talk to them live right now mm -hmm. um, so that we can keep our friendship alive while borders are closed. Yeah, COVID's definitely changed the dynamic of... Yeah in connection and interaction it's been like a great i think collective learning experience for all of us um i have a question for you dallas yes <laughs> so we've talked a lot today about social media and self identity and all these things what kind of things do you talk to the young people you uh, volunteer with about all this what kind of advice or guidance do you give them these 13 year old women, girl, young girls you work with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's hard to, when, I don't have kids obviously, so these are my kids and, I, and, I, and I'm learning, I guess, like how to parent through them a little bit and realizing that, and then, and then reflecting on my own experience and how I deal with them. But it's, it's hard to tell someone at 13, 14 that like, their their problems are not going to be their forever problems and it's hard for them to kind of wrap their brain around i guess sometimes the advice that i give to them because in their world it's so like everything that's happening right now is happening right now and it's going to happen forever and um this is the biggest problem even though it's so it's going to be so small in their grand scheme of their life um but in terms of social media like i just try to remind them that things are not so concrete all the time and that it's not just like black and white and that there's a lot of gray in the world um and because i deal with girls one of the biggest conversations we have is going to be like is usually around body image and how they want to look and i think there really is no I don't know. And I think that's why I like talking about this so much is because I'm trying to get like little tidbits from other people on how to like navigate this with them because I never even, like I didn't have social media until I was like 15 or 16. So like I had already 
kind of figured my stuff out and I didn't have all of this comparison that they have. And I don't even know how to approach that with them because they're so surrounded by it all the time. And I, yeah, I do, like I said earlier, that's kind of my biggest concern when it comes to social media. So do, when I do talk about it, it's more in, in the concept of, of how they are dealing with it because it's definitely super amplified for them. And I don't, I don't know what the solution is. When you're reflecting on that question, um, when you have young people turning to you for advice, mm -hmm. how does that influence or impact the way you model social media use? Yeah, I think, not I think I know, I have made a lot of the changes in my life in terms of how I use social media and what I post on social media and how much time I spend on social media in response to how I wish they would, I guess, use it. Like I try to encourage cutting back and being careful with what you post because everything you post is gonna be seen for basically the rest of your life and it's really hard to delete stuff and um, yeah. Yes, I think that's, I, I've, yeah. How, how do you, how is your identity impacted by your online identity? Um, I will admit I put a lot of, not a lot, but quite a bit of um, value on my online persona. And I try not to make it a persona, but just like a reflection of who I am in real life. And I, like I said earlier, I try to keep it very like solid. Like I like to be the same across all, all borders, but I do really enjoy the kind of like, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Now I'm it is self-expression. I understand that part. It is self-expression, and I and I do enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. But yes, like I said, I try to keep, to be stagnant among online and in real life. I don't want to be different online than I am in real life. Yeah. How I, many? What percentage of people that follow you on Instagram would you guess are people that you would actually? say our friends true friends i have very few friends that i like i'm super close with like my my friend group is very small i would say like maybe two percent out of a hundred like if a hundred people interact with a photo or something probably it, like okay four four of them truly know me in real life, in real time. And like, that also speaks volumes. And that scares me too, right? Because a lot of, it is just nonsense. Yeah. I didn't say that to, to make that point or to scare you, I'm curious. Um, it, that's my experience too. Actually, my experience is a lot more of my, the people, I have very few followers and I follow very few people, but there a lot of them are friends. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just interesting to me because I'm trying to get the sense of what the payoff is other than what we know about the neural science that's happening here purposefully by the people who are creating these things. Um, what is the payoff to putting so much, um, investing so much time and energy into someone's online persona? Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> Cause I, as I get older, I don't, I, there like the, it's value depletes for me. I found especially entering my 20s and like the last two years making a lot of conscious changes in how I use it and placing less value on it has is changing it's there's a decline as I get older and so I'm thinking like at the rate we're working at right now I'm assuming by the time I'm like 30 so that's like nine or eight or nine years from now um I, it'll probably be a very small part of my life. So then do you think there's much of a difference between all those things that we tried on for size during this stage of our development and the way they're using social media to do the same thing? Maybe there's not a huge difference. Yeah, maybe it's just a different format. Maybe it's not 
doesn't cause that much harm? I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I'm suggesting that. I'm just saying like, maybe this is just a different way of having this stage of your development. Yeah, I think, I think you're onto something there. I think they could be paralleled for sure. Yeah, I don't think- As long so. as it's not, you know, what 98% of your life's all about. As long as you have a real life too, that's offline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm asking questions, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know the answer. I'm yeah. Thinking. Yeah, that's good. Except uh, I mean, we can go back to that real time experience. What is learned in the interactions of being with people in real life time, which so in social development, like there's certain social development milestones that we make by being with other people. Mm -hmm. This is part of the big inquiry right now that um, people's social skills aren't developing the same as they were in other generations because things are happening in virtual spaces. That's kind of what I was trying to get at when I was asking you guys about like the development of your yeah, young identity, I guess. And I think, yeah, there's different, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm just like, <laughs> uh, this is a huge conversation. I honestly didn't expect it to be this big and I'm gonna be thinking about this for days. <laughs> It's so fun to talk to somebody at your life stage, and I know I know you're a really smart, thoughtful, insightful person. So it's really interesting to talk to you about this because you seem like you're in transition too. Because I know I am, yeah. I because of your age and stage, yeah. Yeah, life's really weird right now. I didn't. I feel, and I think I told you this before, Jody, but I feel like I'm graduating high school again in the sense of like being so confused and like solidify, like in the process of solidifying my identity and then taking into consideration everything that's going on. And our topic today is one of those many things that's going on that is like, it's, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're right, like, right but it's the eve of your launch into adulthood, right? Uh, yeah. That's a big one. I know. So hopefully I can watch like this. I'll keep it and I'll watch it in like 10 years and be like, oh, you were crazy. <laughs> and you, yeah, like. Yeah. Or you were, wow, I was really thoughtful and I was thinking about things and I was paying yeah. attention because I think that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to sense my own confusion for sure because I can sense it now. I'll sense it in the future. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead. I can't. Yeah. Go, please, please. Yeah, your social media presence might change because you're probably about to work, move into the great work of your life, like the way that you're going to service the community in the work that you do. Mm -hmm. And most people want their work to be known about, right? And one of the ways that people share the great work and impact in their community is through social media. So it might become less about building your identity mm -hmm. um, right. as an individual, as a person becoming and into, okay, this is my work. This is my work that I'm so passionate about. It's so beneficial for our world. And I want as many people to know about it as possible. Mm -hmm. That's like a very different presence on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sure that's where you're heading. Dallas. <laughs> no, yeah. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. And I know a lot, like, I, yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm still processing as we're having these conversations, but it's really important for me to like, be able to like, get it out there and then have people who I trust receive it and go, Hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? And so I really value you sitting down with me today and talking about this even if half of it didn't make sense or if it did or like I just thank you so much this was really beneficial and I am feel so honored that you guys took time out of your day to talk to me <laughs> like thank you right back at you yeah thank you back for at you so uh, honest yeah and thoughtful thank you
Great. Um, well, I'm going to say goodbye then because this is my third Space Live show. Thank you, Dallas, for hosting the show. That was really thought provoking and hopefully it'll uh, influence a lot of other people to our age and your age to think more about this topic. So uh, thank you for joining us and we'll see you all again soon next time on Third Space Live.